we're at the end of the day, but we would like to discuss a couple of things with you. Um, uh, and first, um, we've prepared a bit of a summary of key messages. We'd like to sort of synthesize a little bit and look over of what um, the speakers today have been discussing with us. Um, there's, as a lot of, uh, uh, several of them mentioned, there's uh, a lot of different ways of how one can think about social listening, but um, it's really important to uh, sort of think about, well, whatever method you end up using, um, it's, uh, it needs to be, you know, why are you doing this analysis? So today was dedicated to this first step uh, in, in infodemic management. This is where, this is the base of the analysis that goes, uh, that informs infodemic management actions later on. So social listening. Social listening to understand what are people's uh, questions and concerns, worries, uh, what kind of narratives are circulating in communities of interest to you, and, and what kind of misinformation is circulating in communities of interest to you. And um, this is really important. This is not only about social media, it's really uh, uh, a broad. Uh, so imagine that you know, what we're trying to understand is a community or, or, uh, or people uh in in different parts uh interacting with the health system or for different parts of society therefore the research uh, approaches will really be tailored to what you're trying to inform there was quite a good discussion on on um, on slido about this well what do you do you know if communities are completely uh offline etc well then you need to adapt of course your your research strategy the way that you you identify their concerns uh differently so key takeaways, why are we talking about uh, social listening uh, and this type of analysis? Uh, because actually, uh, and you heard this a couple of times last time and today, information voids are actually a bigger problem for health authorities than rumors and misinformation. So you know, if one does an analysis, a, a thorough analysis, social listening analysis of what people's concerns are, what are their worries, um, what occupies them, uh, when they're talking about a particular uh, uh, theme or topic, well, then you you can actually proactively um, uh, uh, design better interventions, better communication, and better interventions in order to react to those. And because these are literally precursors to rumors and misinformation. So if we do not uh, uh, feel that tension for for information tension uh, in, in the conversation space, uh, then rumors and misinformation are going to uh, fill it. Uh, and this is why this is a very important step. It's not a one-time st uh, uh, step, it's a process. Uh, all all um, lectures today were, were talking about this. It needs to be uh, a continuous activity that then informs uh, all of the other steps in infodemic management. And of course, um, depending on what context you will be using, either more online or offline sources of information, different types of me methodologies, quantitative and qualitative to, to help you understand uh, what worries people. So um, really important, um, and I think Sarani mentioned this uh, quite eloquently, one really needs to focus on uh, who are the key populations that are for, for the purpose of your health program. So she was talking from the purpose of an immunization program. We could also be looking from the purpose of managing the COVID-19 pandemic. You could also be looking uh, from other health perspectives, like we had examples yesterday from health promotion in NCDs, um, et cetera. So when you understand uh, which are the populations that have the heaviest burden or at highest at risk, um, uh, for example, for COVID-19, uh, then you would be also prioritizing to understand their th those communities and uh, much better. Of course, um, what's really important is if you want to do this type of analysis on a on a routine, a rapid basis, you really need to use data sources that you have at hand. Uh, not only social media analytics or CAP surveys, but really everything that you have available, whether you are, they are hotlines or some kind of um, uh, medical records, uh, partners may have data sets, et cetera. So really what's important is uh, not to uh, get into this ambition of 
um, trying to collect data for the sake of data collection. But if you do invest into data collection, you have to have really good reasoning and also think about sustainability and feasibility of this over long, long term. So uh, that you can really, uh, so that you really invest first and use the data that you already have available. Liz, do you want to summarize uh, the next five bullet points? Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so we you, it was really clear even from the first poll that you took today and in, in the discussions that we had with Sarani and with Chris and Chris um, that these these uh, you know, these tools really were designed for online marketing and we need to heavily modify them and they're probably not sufficient for measuring uh, and doing social listening for the infodemic. We have to move past that. And then of course, all data sources and tools have major limitations. You've heard us use the term iceberg, recognizing that we really can only measure what is visible and above the waterline. And we will never get a fully representative understanding of all the questions and concerns and information voids and missing disinformation that is affecting people or that people are having. So it's really important for us to be thoughtful about um, appropriately contextualizing um, social listening reporting um, and recommendations that come from those reports. There is no magic dashboard. Analysis can only be integrated by humans and not IT tools. Um, most IT tools are not super smart. Um, and it really requires um, us to contextualize further and, and figure out what is actually useful and helpful versus what's not. Um, and then you know, we also need to develop a plan for integrated analysis that is based on programmatic needs um, and present those insights in the report in a way that are actionable by colleagues that can take action based on it. So I'll give you an example. Um, if you are a health authority and you notice that there is a lot of mis and disinformation that um, is extremely political in nature, um, that involves a lot of conspiracy thinking, um, that the issues that are not directly related to public health programming, Although it's helpful to note that this is a concern, that you just have a significantly uh, smaller degree of influence on, on the politics of it, then you might uh, try to address people's questions and concerns about vaccine safety, for example. So just think about um, what is in a health authority's wheelhouse to address and how to address it and focus your efforts on trying to do integrated analysis, uh, particularly on the topics and concerns that you know the health system needs to be better able to address and is best positioned mm -hmm. to address compared to other parts of government. So just note that. Um, and and, and this, this is why it's really important to understand what is it that your colleagues need, what kind of insights would be most relevant and helpful for them for them to offer better programming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, uh, if social listening is done well, you will actually uh, learn about concerns from communities, not only about what works and what kind of information needs they have. You actually can find out and also about um, issues regarding how uh, their access to health services or how the services are designed, etc. So a lot of the insights potentially and recommendations that you can uh, make or or highlight really uh, can be used not only for, by the health communication, health promotion colleagues, but perhaps also other parts of, if we're talking about COVID-19 response, other parts of response or the health program in general, like immunization program, et cetera. So um, this is really uh, an activity that brings in um, a systematic approach to, to uh, be more responsive to, to the concerns and needs of, uh, of people. So we did prepare uh, also a little bit of, <coughs> excuse me, a few links to the key resources. resources. Um, most of them were, were mentioned uh, during today um, by, uh, by our colleagues, uh, the speakers. I'd like to point out to you the, uh, as an additional uh, resource, um, just for a variety of tools, we put it here on in, in the first summary slide. The WHO Infodemic Management News Flash. Actually, there was a fresh edition that was just uh, that just came out today. You can subscribe to it every two weeks. You get into your box uh, the latest tools, the latest articles, the latest events that potentially you may be interested in attending, um, uh, potential job openings, um, etc. Um, what uh, is also probably uh, very uh, of interest to you in in the social listening topic of today is that um, very soon we will be also publishing um, uh, two and several actually different toolkits and guides that uh, can help you also think about infodemic management and how to position, uh, for example, social listening and integrated analysis in your workflows. So this is the field infodemiology guides that um, um, our team and uh, US CDC team together with partners 
um, are putting together, which hopefully will uh, be ready in, in, in a draft, solid draft by the end of the year. And we will circulate that in the community as well as different, uh, different toolkits that basically allow you to either do uh, complement social media listening. So analysis of social media with uh, rapid assessments of online communities that actually span uh, across several networks or uh, social networks online, or uh, how does one do uh, human-centered um, community-based listening uh, in the community offline? So all of this is actually in the works. Um, like I said, our slides are busy. Yes, uh, last time our slides are, are busy because we currently are still writing quite a lot of toolkits and guidance uh, for you to use. So you end up getting a huge uh, un a load uh, of information from us uh, through this way. Liz, do you want to get us through the metrics? Absolutely. So um, these are just some of the examples of the types of metrics that were mentioned today. Um, and also just recognizing that um, there's a lot more than just likes and shares that you can track. And you also notice that there's um, several metrics um, that are on this list that are have nothing to do with uh, you know, melt, the meltwaters or the crowd tingles of the world. Um, they have to do with things like geolocation data, um, call center logs, community listing. Um, there's a variety of ways you can do integrated analysis with other types of data sources that are offline um, um, or, or even online, just not in places where you typically would find information. For example, geolocation data, mobility data was a big thing last year um, from Google, trying to understand how people's behaviors was actually changing um, in, in, in the time of um, public health and safety measures being put into place and restricting social move, uh, movement of people. So that's an example of technically a digital information stream and a type of metric you can use that you really will not find in a Meltwater dashboard. So we really think you need to use many different types of metrics and measures to kind of better understand and measure different parts of the elephant. Mm -hmm. And just a hint, uh, task number three is um, an example that would help you think through when you review uh, uh, the state of infodemic report, um, critically review um, the insights, uh, for example, that are presented there. So what would uh, infodemic managers who work in the field uh, need to know uh, regarding social listening? Well, it's really important that you um, uh, uh, first really inform yourself and try to figure out who actually has access, who is collecting and who can provide you access to relevant uh, social listening data. So really you need to network um, and make really good working relationships really also be very thoughtful about how you approach um, um, the method uh, with met methodologically, how do you approach the analysis? So we call this uh, the taxonomy for social listening, which means that uh, how are you gonna systematically code and uh, track the, the topics that uh, are being discussed so that you can in a routine fast way uh, identify where are the gaps in information or, or knowledge and then this will enable you to much more quickly um, uh, generate insights and, uh, and analysis that are relevant that can then be easily uh, filled. Uh, sometimes you'll see that programmatic uh, colleagues in the program are going to say that um, you know what was relevant three weeks ago, two weeks ago is not relevant today anymore. Things really shift very fast. The needs of communities shift very fast. The response. Uh, so um, it's not about actually having <laughs> a perfect series of data sets. You, uh, you need to actually look at routine data sets and have a systematic way of analyzing. So really, uh, when you analyze it, really formulate, think about the insights in such a way that you present them uh, so that uh, people that in program or across the health uh, system actually could recognize and, and see how they could actually act on them. So um, it's really important also to uh, always keep in mind social listening, it cannot be confused, is not the same as analysis of social media or, or of a health authority's brand for reputation management or as an external communications function. This is not the, the thing, even though we may be using meltwaters or we may be using crowd tangle or we may be using uh, maybe similar metrics, et cetera, the type of analysis and the insights is very different than uh, the type that is needed for, for example, an external communications function and the health authority. Um, that really make sure that uh, the insights and your reports are actually 
uh, not just uh, that they come into the hands of people that can act on it, but that they also are engaged with it and that you really uh, encourage also translation into practice. Just publishing a report and disseminating is not enough. There needs to be a clear follow through as much as possible to, to do so. What about the managers? Liz? So uh, yeah, one of the most important things a manager can do is educate other, others about the definition of social listening and epidemic management because everyone has a different idea of what this means. And just educating is going to go a long way to help make sure that people are on the same page. Social listening is the first step of infodemic management. It is not all of the infodemic management. So it is just the first thing you do, and which is mitigating the harms caused by the confusion, lack of credible information, and too much information. The goal of infodemic management is to ensure that the right message reaches the right audience at the right time via the right channel and the right messenger, and that populations have an enabling environment to act enact healthy behaviors. Um, and these interventions uh, are used to inform communication, social, behavioral, and policy interventions that can improve uh, health service delivery and promote healthy behaviors and build uh, resilient communities. And uh, social listening is far more than just mis and disinformation. It is the sexy, shiny object everyone wants to pay attention to, but the bigger problem is actually information voids and the fact that we are not doing enough to address people's basic questions and concerns right now. And if we can't even get that right, how can we possibly try to address mis and disinformation which is already out in the ether and widespread by the time it's picked up mm -hmm. by a lot of different infodemic management social listening um, uh, platforms. So you really need to think holistically about the entire information environment. And then it needs to be conducted both online and offline. So we've been talking about the mountain bike, the four by four and the luxury vehicle. And we're gonna use this uh, analogy throughout um, our time together um, in, this, um, in this training. And what this means is that Mountain bike is usually one guy, one person who is supposed to be the infodemic manager for a state, a province, a country, you name it. Um, someone who might not be well resourced, um, who might be just working in emergency response function, uh, limited financial and human resources, and lack of political or strategic buy-in. They don't have a they ha don't have a manager that took this infodemic manager training. That is one of the issues that, that, that this particular person might be facing. So just recognizing that um, we all probably start on the mountain bike. Even at CDC, we started on a mountain bike. We're now trying to lobby for a four by four. What's a four by four? So a four by four program is an infodemic management um, team um, that you have sufficient staff and resources for moderate capacity where you can leverage existing resources and tools and relationships, but it's mostly stood up in an emergency response. You might be regularly pushing out insights, but you might struggle with more ad hoc requests. Um, funding might not be stable. It might be difficult to generate very speedy insights because you might be limited by human resources. Maybe you only have two people, not 10. Um, and then um, these recommendations are not routinely considered or only implemented by the health system or communications team sometimes. So just considering that this is kind of the middle of the road. And then the luxury vehicle model, if you're very lucky to have not only a manager that understands what you're doing, but someone who can advocate for uh, infodemic management funding and resources, um, this is this is the dream. Everyone wants to live this dream where you have a well-staffed resources and supported unit with multiple staff with defined roles um, and that you have IM integrated in routine and emergency functions um, and also develop those um, products on a regular basis and uh, able to handle ad hoc requests. Um, and you want to be able to offer those subnational insights at speed as well as segmented insights for specific communities. One of the biggest um, limitations for all three of um, uh, the, 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 the folks that spoke today for both US CDC, UNICEF, and WHO is that we're only able to offer really national level insights. All of our countries that we work in are extremely complex. And if you have to be in a large country, um, it's even more challenging to um, uh, really get down to uh, more local insights, particularly when it comes to, for example, vaccine confidence. Vaccine hesitancy is always local. It is always contextual. And the infodemic is always local and contextual. And it is difficult to uh, be helpful when you have a state or province calling and asking for help when all you're able to offer is something that is at the national level, which may or may not be applicable. So um, a luxury vehicle team might be able to have that subnational capacity and then having those insights that are regularly discussed and integrated in just not just emergency response functions, but in routine as well. So what does this mean in context of this conversation for social listening? If you are on a mountain bike and you're one dude or one lady, you want to be focusing on utilizing existing data sources and, and understanding the most vulnerable populations. Uh, you also want to be thinking about um, how you can best leverage existing partners and data sources. And if you plan on analyzing with their data sources, give them a value add, you know, give them something back. 
after you got data from them. So um, uh, you can report out on those insights for them to use. If you are in a four by four, you might want to add more data sources, especially with those with better access to vulnerable populations. Sometimes that can mean that the, uh, collecting data or analyzing it is more expensive, but you might have some resources to do that. Uh, you also might have this team that has dedicated staff for social listening, such as analysts focused on specific data sources. And then finally, you're creating active demand for your insights products. Um, and then if you have the, four, if the luxury vehicle option in the dream, um, you want to be able to develop new data sources where you have limited availability and consider investing in routine data sources and representative data collection. So not anecdotal, not, uh, truly re uh, representative of the population you're trying to understand. And then regularly assess the needs of insight report stakeholders and insights products and modify accordingly. So monitoring and evaluation is, is really important here. Um, and then work with your communications and program staff to develop improved messages, which is what we're going to talk about a lot next time around, including uh, better programmatic um, um, action based on the insights that you develop through Infodemic Management mm -hmm. Social Listening.